Okay, so uh, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm from Egalia, and we've been talking here on lots of things about the health of the web ecosystem. And this was kind of a conversation that got started with the idea that there are historically only rather simple discussions around any of this, and they usually when something bad happens. But how do we actually judge whether things are going well or not going well, and maybe there's something that we can do about it to make it better. Uh, so I can't actually think of two better people to have on to discuss this. Maybe you could introduce yourselves. Sure. Why not? I am Pia Mancini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Open Collective. Um, Open Collective is a platform that aims at enabling communities to be sustainable by receiving funding and facilitating that funding without each of them needing to have their own legal entity or bank account. So essentially, we support open source projects um, and other communities in their path to financial sustainability by giving them transparent financial tools and funding management tools, as well as a fiscal sponsor. So a place where they can essentially um, put the money and we take care of everything else. I was born in Argentina and currently live in Spain. So I, I think it's also interesting that like you have these sort of larger democracy ideas as well that um, I, I feel are kind of very related. <laughs> like why, why do we look at things the way that we do? And I, I wonder, I hope that we wind up interleaving some of that. Sure. In there. Um, so then, uh, my friend Jory, I'll, you want to introduce yourself, Jory? Sure. Um, I'll introduce myself the way I introduce you sometimes. You know, hi, I'm Jory Burson, and, you know, Jory from the internet, um, Brian from the internet. Um, I work with a number of different open source and open standards organizations to improve the human and technical interoperability of the projects. Most recently includes um, uh, work on the OpenJS Foundation for AMP and Node and jQuery uh, and, and the 30 some odd projects they have. I've also recently done a lot of work on um, open source projects with Oasis, which are largely crypto technology projects like Baseline and Ethereum. And then um, by the time this uh, broadcast is out, I think the Open Web Docs project, which we're collaborating on with Open Collective, will be live. So I've been program managing that as well. And I get mm. a lot of cool people and help them out. And that's what I do. We're talking about this uh, both open source and open standards. What is open source and why is it the way that it is. I think I think that's interesting because like standards are young actually comparatively like the formal standards bodies the way we look at them we're still kind of trying to figure out how to do them in a way and software is obviously even younger and open source is even younger than that. Um I think this is a great like philosophical question to be asking at this moment in time because it's also a question that's being re-asked on Twitter and a number of like other developer circles. What what is open source? Um, and for there's this thread a couple days ago actually that um, Toby Langel started where he really kind of shared this this construct that you know there's the the class of folks who view open source as primarily being about the license and for a long time in like particularly like the 80s and early 90s it was that you know open source was just functionally the permissiveness of the license but over time we've added these other components to the idea of open source which include you know some indication of how the project is governed so is that a you know benevolent dictator is that a group of peers who are democratically making decisions about the project, that kind of thing. Is that a single company that has sort of 
nominally created an open source project by putting it in the open and putting a permissive license on it, but not necessarily allowing, and this is kind of what some of the complaints are around Elastic uh, at the moment, right? It's out there, but they're not necessarily taking contributions from uh, from the community. So that then you bring in not just the governance, but also sort of how well, how easy is it for people to contribute back into that project? And And I think all of that, and probably even more, kind of lead to a sense of how open source and open source project is versus, you know, whether it's open source and name only or something like that. And I think I think we're at a point where we're redefining what open source means in other terms beyond the license. And, and that's sort of the task of our next few years, I think. I find that so interesting because for me, when I kind of started uh, in the open source world, I arrived to it from a completely different approach, like a super pragmatic approach. Like I had nothing to do with like the philosophy behind it. It was, um, or um, the first software we did for Democracy OS, um, that this software we created for citizen debate and voting when we when we had our political party in, in Buenos Aires. Um, we did it open source because we we're, you know, collaborating and, and it just felt like it, it had to do with the ethos of what we were doing. But then the, the, the practicality of it was what amazed me. I remember it, we were just starting to build it in Argentina. And one of our developers, um, one of the developers in the, in, in, in the group sent us a message saying, hey, do you recognize this? And it was our software translated to Arabic and French used by um, used in Tunisia to debate the constitution. And for me, that was like mind-blowing. And this was like a month after we started building it. And so for me, open source became kind of that, that way, you know, to spread ideas that were not only technology ideas, but like profoundly political ideas. And that's how I got immersed in the open source world. And then obviously digging more into that and, and building open source ourselves and using open source tools ourselves, kind of the, the immediate problem of the sustainability of, of a community like that was um, became very clear to me. There's all kinds of reasons why people are drawn to open source, like at, at all ends of that. Like if you if you have an open source thing with good licensing, then you don't have to buy licenses and and do all kinds of things. It's sort of there. It's somewhat in the commons. Just to that point, like, and we've got a great system of um, at this point, like software foundations and standards bodies and all of that. Like that whole structure has really been built to support the licensing component. But you know, to Pia's point, it's like what what systems have been built to support like the ideas you know like the the that that vector of yeah i know that and and like for and that is changing a lot but for many years when we were you know doing this open source tech um for citizen participation like it was really tough for us to receive to get funding for that like more traditional sources of funding um at least in latin america but the classic is that they they'll fund everything except tech in general that changed in the last couple of years, but it's difficult. It's difficult to um, get the funding you need to sustain a project, right? And and for us it was particularly painful at points because um, again what we were doing was very political, and so like the communities in different countries that were depending on on this or that were not depending, but they were using heavily this software for their own, you know, voting and um, legislative debates at a citizen level. Like the responsibility we felt was, you know, pretty big. And then when someone still, you know, sends me an email saying, hey, we want to use Democracy OS in Chile or in, you know, wherever. Um, and I know it's not maintained. So I'm like, you should, you know, what? It's tough. It's a it's a very I don't know. 
it's a difficult problem. But um, I think the funding um, approach has been evolving. But like five, six years back, it was it was really tough to fu- to fund this type of um, open source. What I like about how we're exploring many things here in Open Collective is one, it's a, I think a really good one. Sort of asking new questions. Pia, you have a, a quote that uh, I don't want to like I don't want to butcher it, but it's like twenty first century citizens. <laughs> yes. Um, it's um, we're 21st century citizens um, trying to live under 19th century designed institutions built for an information technology of the 15th century. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ice <laughs> cold. <laughs> yeah. we, know we feel we are, right? We are like doing our best to kind of live under a set of political, democratic, um, you know, power distributing institutions. Um, that were created in, you know, the 19th century for a 19th century society that had an information technology that was the p- printing press um, and relied on that communication technology, right? And everything changed so dramatically. And we are still, you know, we're still trying to live under this same set of institutions. I find it, um, yeah, mind-blowing that we are still here. <laughs> but but I think that it's actually really astute and it's like related to so so many things, at least I see related to so many things that we're talking about. Like we have lots of things that are sort of the way they are because of their history, right? Like uh, they were created to solve the problems that we thought we had, but the, the, the problem keeps changing and, and we're still learning like what even is a good solution. And so I think one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was I think in another one of your talks, you you said like, like apathy isn't a bug. It, it's kind of a feature. Um, yeah. So we have this, we have this idea that we have like representative democracy sorts of things that we've tried because like not everybody can worry about all of the things all the time. Mm-hmm. And so so to some sense, part of the reason that things are the way they are is because like nobody has to question them because to at least some extent for most people, they kind of function. Does that, am I yeah. completely misrepresenting no, that? Or? No, not at all. I think, I mean, I, I do believe that apathy is a feature of the system and not a bug. Um, and I think that it's been used as a bug, saying like people don't want to engage because they don't care. And I think that is, that it's not true. I think that, you know, people do care and they do engage. They just do not want to engage in the terms that the current system is proposing. And why would we, right? Like it's, it's, it's a system where you are, I mean, you can decide between, you know, a preset, preset options, an array that the system proposes but you cannot be involved in designing those options, right? You are called every couple of years to say yes or nay to, you know, what happened, but, and then you're expected to go back to, you know, private sphere and make money, right? So the, our current political system kind of relies on its citizenship being somewhat, um, you know, um, apathetic um, and just, showing up when they're called to. And I think that what is different from if you want the internet generation is that um, we are used to representing ourselves all the time. Like who's going to tell us that we can't go somewhere or say something or participate in a debate? Like the the, the bandwidth um, that, you know, we have for engaging, collaborating, contributing, it's so big that the, the you know, when we have to go back to what I call the legacy system and vote once every couple of years, it seems like such a, um, a, a, a poor input, right, into the system. Um, and I think that there's a lot of noise in the system because of this uh, in general. Um, and I guess going back to what we were discussing, you know, before, and for me, open source is also that way of building, building things on the on the internet as a jurisdiction right on the internet as 
like and I, and I, I know this is contentious because the internet is not you know obviously what we all thought it was <laughs> 15 years ago but you know but but bear with me right the internet has, has this this jurisdiction where you know we can all come together as commons um as peers right in in a commons and so so open source for me is a, it's a, it, it's a pivotal part of that because we need to be able to build structures outside of the nation states outside of the current institutions and build those bridges and, and, and infrastructure outside of it that enables us to, it's a bit like the browser, right? You you don't want to deal with the operating system. You just want to build above. I'm really kind of appreciating this framing because, you know, the standardization process is what allows eventually um, after a great deal of time, too much time, um, allows that foundation to exist for, you know, all of the innovation, you know, on top. But to your point about inputs being kind of out of out of whack and, and apathy being not not a bug, but a feature, ideally, you know, when we talk about standardizing web and internet related technologies, it should be a fairly orderly and non-dramatic proceeding because there's been enough of the input, you know, an agreement and that kind of thing, you know, going around beforehand. So for the most part, if you've, you know, innovating and that sort of thing, you're not necessarily surprised by anything that gets um, standardized, but that's not really been how it's been working. And the standardization processes of many uh, organizations aren't well equipped to gather all of the feedback and input. And that definitely creates, I think, a lot of problems. You know, it slows slows us down in many ways um, and it makes it harder to create that that foundation. So so I think there's there's some balance that has to be struck between like engaging everyone and then also making sure that we've got to a point where a decision has been made, memorialized, and we can we can now bake that into the soil of our, you know, internet and build on top of it in a reliable way. Yeah. Um, governance is <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does do are there any kind of you know voting mechanisms in place or or how does it does it work? Is it like uh, consensus, you know. Yeah, and so so you know, I think maybe people don't realize that every single standards making organization has a different um, process, or most of them have slightly different processes. There's not one process to to rule them all, and furthermore, they're not all created equal, right? Like the W3C has a mandate to create standards for the web, but they're an industry consortia, which is you know, in the United States, something a little bit different than, say, you know, a European standards making organization. They, they're on slightly different international standing. And all of that rolls up, obviously, into like this global policy setting system that helps to regulate and make consistent how uh, technology and markets operate across those borders. You know, if we want to go, you know, to a... Uh, society where we're not really concerned too much about um, those those international borders. Well, we've got to have some way of creating the agreement for how things operate across borders. And this, the standards, the standardization system does that, you know, to, to get there, you know, every org has to have, have some well-defined process. And those processes generally involve lots of rules around how decisions are taken and made, who can be part of those decisions. But it's usually like a, a vote or a consensus-driven process on a technical committee level that advances to the broader organization. So, you know, your working group or your technical committee at W3C or ECMA agrees that the spec is is complete and ready to advance to the next stage. And then there might be an organization-wide vote where all of the members of that organization say, yes, we agree that, that what the committee has done is acceptable to us will 
and maybe we'll do a round of call for public comments, or maybe we'll do a round for call for um, statements of use. Uh, where companies say, here's how we're using this standard. And those things might be requirements before a broader organization vote. The organization votes, they say, yes, this is now a W3C standard, or this is now an OASIS standard or whatever. And then from there, the they, from there they take that standard perhaps to CINCINELEC or ITU or ISO, uh, to a joint technical committee at ISO, um, and that then it has to go through that process again, where there's you know a committee reviewing it, um, agreeing that it meets needs, statements of use, call for public comment, yet another vote, and so you see, you can hopefully see then how this can be a multi-year process. Gosh, to Pia's question about like how does it work is like well there. Are, there kind of isn't in it. Um, so when you look at standards bodies, uh, first of all, the definition, like Jory said, of like, what do you mean by a standards body is like kind of variable. But if you look, there's a lot of them and they all work differently. And you might wonder, why is that? And I, I think really the answer is mostly because we're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, because uh, a lot of these are created in response to what was there was not already working well. And so we try something else. Um, and none of them also it's worth noting are frozen in time. So like they don't work the same way as when they were created. Cause like they well, recognize and learn do. as well. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But it, like on the, on the whole, they, they tend to change in some ways. Uh, we have many of them that are ultimately reliant on voluntary participation if you look at standards for the browser for example mm -hmm. um it's hard work like it's, it's it's a lot of hard work and currently a lot like a in very oversized amount of that work is footed by the browser vendors and as such like practically speaking they have a sort of critical voice in the prioritization of things and whether they get done or not so let, let me let me kind of try this out just via perhaps comparison. You know, obviously we all know that there's a difference between internet technologies and web technology, right? Like that's that's um, closely closely related, but actually separate. And the internet as that you know soil that commons you know that everybody can uh, build on and use is still actively maintained they're still working on internet standards and you know that sort of thing and it the process to do that primarily through things like um, IETF is funded by ISOC and a good deal of money that is earned by ISOC through the sale of uh, and management of um, the, the the DNS the domain names and that allows IETF to run. It allows them to do grants and, um, you know, sponsorship and research and study and all that kind of stuff because, you know, uh, because I pay $10 for joryburson.com, you know, or whatever a year. And that that works. The, the web doesn't, despite, you know, also having a nice community of people who care about web standards, um, we don't have a central funding source for for these activities. So what does drive the funding for participation is the primary business model of the web, which is, you know, ad monies earned by browser vendors and that and, and companies who are participating because they run, you know, internet or sorry, web web businesses that rely on those technologies. And a lot of companies can't afford to or don't necessarily like look at participation in web standards uh, as being so critical to their organization that they have to, you know, pay dues and vote and and frankly in some cases like it's probably too in the weeds right for 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 them um 
So the question is like, is that something that they need to pay attention to or, or is it a feature that they can be apathetic? That is sort of the question, right? Like once we state it that way and we, we, and we say this, is, this is how it is currently, there is a question of, is that a good thing? Or should it be that way? Like, why, why is it that way? <laughs> and um, I think it is largely that way by force of history and that there are some good things about it and there are some bad things about it. And uh, one of the bad things about it is that it is in like, it is entirely voluntary and trickle down to a couple of, you know, really big companies. Ultimately, really big companies don't last forever. <laughs> they change and shift and um, so do, so does their appetite and, and their ideas about things. And so, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit like um, maybe it would be a good thing if a company built a bridge. I don't know. <laughs> like if everybody could use the bridge, maybe that's good, but then who is going to maintain that bridge forever? And uh, you know, how do we fund other bridges and public, infrastructure safety. So one of the things that we have done very recently is this idea of, it's called open prioritization. We're taking things that normally would be implemented by a browser vendor. The trouble is, again, that's entirely opaque. We don't know when they'll implement it or if ever, maybe sometimes. And we just trying to involve more people in prioritizing that work and helping rethink why, why we do that. I, th I think my sort of like my analogy in my own mind is when I was a little kid, cable television was like relatively new. And my grandmother thought that that was just like crazy. Why would somebody pay for television? It's free. It comes over the air, right? But in the US, the television and radio and everything was, of course, not free. It was built on advertising and introducing new models to think about that turned out to be like very interesting <laughs> so we have things like netflix and hulu and even pbs and um bbc all of these are like different and good in their own ways so uh open prioritization we're partnering with open collective uh on that yeah so what i really liked about um open prioritization and I think it's it also ties with what Jory was saying before about, um, you know, how can you strike this balance between like seeking all opinions and then actually kind of getting something done or like moving something forward, right? Um, so when I was trying in my <laughs> previous life, um, I was trying to get the city of Buenos Aires to do um, participatory budgeting and kind of citizen voting of legislation. Um, so instead of, you know, we voting for someone who then vote, who then votes whatever they want, like we get involved in the voting process um, at a legislative level, right? Um, and so when I was trying to sell that, the way I found of um, selling it or, you know, getting my point across or getting enough political will to do it um, was doing first a prioritization scheme. So the idea was we're gonna, I sat down with like, you know, the urban planning officers of the city and I'm like, okay, for this neighborhood, which are the you know public work construction or improvements that you know you're going to do in this year that are budgeted for you know this year and then let's take those and ask folks to prioritize them right as a first step to because it, in that way we didn't dramatically change the budget of uh, the you know the city urban planners but at the same time we started getting that flexibility that I don't know, gymnastics, I guess, in in engagement, right? In actually being responsible. Because, and this is, when, you know, when we talk about participatory democracy or when we talk about citizen engagement, I feel like um, if a lot of the pushback comes from this notion that we, the citizens, how can we decide? We don't know anything. We're not experts. We, you know, how, what, everyone's going to, you know, have a say. And so 
I think that is very, very obviously like unfair and it's not a good argument, but there is a reality to it that we haven't been doing this ever, right? And so we also need to start building responsible citizens. We also need to start kind of going through that process of being responsible for our decisions. So I'm a very fan of prioritization as um, that first step towards getting more engagement data, right? Um, because it's not super risky. Um, and Brian, what you, did is, what you did is exactly that. You know, all of these projects, you, you want to do it, right? You want to do them. You just wanted to see which one you should do first, right? And you used money as a proxy for that. Um, and I thought it was a very clever um, approach. Yeah, I, I think, well, I should let Jory, I think Jory was going to respond. Well, I, I was going to say, you know, I think it was a certainly a very impactful way to sort of one one question that we're always asking is like, what do what what can we do to help web developers, you know, at at, at Open Web Docs and, and MDN, you know, we've we've the we've done the developer needs assessment for a few years. What what are their pain points? What problems can we be solving for them so that they can they can do their jobs? And this is another way in, uh, of surveying them in in a sense, and not just in the here's what what hurts me, but also here's what I would pay someone to fix for me. And that's such that's such good um, information. Um, you just really can't can't beat that kind of uh, feedback. Yeah, I think one of the things that is like interesting about how we tried to construct that is that like it it does cost money to do those things and currently somebody else pays for that through voluntary participation. So we're not accustomed to paying for it directly, but of course just like the TV where you know you're 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 paying for it uh, currently. Um, you just don't realize it, but like putting, putting things out there in, in that way sort of helps, I hope start the conversation about how these work. And I think that it helps combat the thing that you mentioned PO, which is like, but you don't even have enough information to really weigh in on this. Right. So if you ask, if you ask developers what they want, it's a little bit like asking like, well, you know, unbound like what mode of transportation would you most desire? <laughs> and like a whole bunch of people would, you know, pick some, you know, a Lotus or a Porsche or some, you know, some flying cars. really, yeah, right. Flying, you know, some flying car, you know, because the problem has no bounds, but you know, uh, a lot of us choose to not even own a car or if we do own a car, it's, you know, considerably more practical than that because like if you if you pose to us an actually you know a, a problem with bounds that are realistic we can make a choice and I, I think that's part of the idea here is like if we if we pose the question in a way is connected with reality here somehow that that input can be used I think it's valuable and it's, it's valuable to help people see like what that takes and what it costs and everything too. So, Jory, you mentioned OWD. Let's we should talk about that because I think that is also super connected. It's part of the commons of the web is good documentation, and you know, for some reason, like this is not built into the standards process. Yeah, it could have been, uh, <laughs> but it, in fact, we tried a, a couple of times to do that, um, but it turned out that the de facto thing that worked was other things? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's interesting because, you know, we've talked about the evolution of open source and standards a little bit. And I think one of the things that's changed in the past few years is sort of what web developers expect from a web standard. And um, before it was like, oh, well, you know, here's a, here's a spec document and just, you know, read the spec and sort of, you know, figure it out. Uh, and then maybe go read the, the documentation provided by each of the separate browser uh, engines and, and just, you know, best of luck. But uh, we've gone from, from that as a reality to, you know, we've got some rules now in many of the working groups where 
you need not just the specification, but you also need corresponding tests in the requisite test suite. You also need um, a couple of different implementations. And I think a sort of fourth component is documentation. And MDN has become over time that de facto space for for excellent and highly available web uh, platform documentation. And you mentioned like web platform docs project, which was one one attempt at creating that, but but MDN really was where everybody you know went. It is still where everybody goes for that information. And Open Web Docs as a project came about um, because we wanted to ensure that a the availability of web platform documentation is always prioritized, you know, that that um, despite the changes that may occur in corporate strategies of different um, browser companies, that there would always be um, tech writers and um, developers and a means to contribute to web documentation so that we can all continue to benefit and learn um, about standardized web tech. And so that's sort of the, the, the central guiding principle, I think. Um, and we're doing that now in large part with, you know, in, in cooperation with and in support of MDN. And as folks probably know, that's a Mozilla resource, which is largely an open source project um, at, this, at this point. They've recently transitioned from older infrastructure to Git and GitHub. And we're going to be doing a great deal to support expansion of community involvement um, on MDN and to support the um, participation and review and, you know, editorial needs of of MDN so that again the the web platform is always and, and, and browser compatibility data and every and everything else that goes along with that so that people can um, can reliably you know count on that that material um, and all of the uh, people and companies that make use of it because we're all and this is maybe one of the problems of open source right there's always like a lot more users people who need to like consume that material then there are necessarily people who are willing to um, or able to contribute back to it in some way and um, in the case of the of documentation we're approaching this from a standpoint of you know yes you can give back and here's how um, and we're excited to be doing that with uh, with Open Collective, and with um, a number of partner organizations like Coil and Google and Microsoft and Mozilla and Agelia and others, so it's also an experiment. Um, it's, to my knowledge, one of the only, or maybe the first. I'm not sure, Pia. You can correct me. Collectives that is actually legally employing people full time yeah. um, to work on uh, open source. Um, yes, for Open Collective, yes, it's a first, and we couldn't be more excited <laughs> about this. <laughs> so uh, we are fans of um, you know of this um, community. So um, so yeah, we have currently um, two technical writers that are on board already, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's definitely a first. It is an experiment, and. From Open Collective and the Open Source Collective, that is the nonprofit um, that is giving Open Web Docs financial uh, fiscal sponsorship. Sorry, yeah, it's a project that we want to support. We want to see grow. So yeah, we're very excited and, and super grateful that we were able to to make this happen, <laughs> which wasn't wasn't a given. <laughs> That's for sure. No, <laughs> yeah, you, you and me both. <laughs> I think it's a super exciting first and it's like it's it's very much in this in, in the vein of this thing that we keep talking about is like we're we're trying to think about how things work and why they work that way and how we do better and this mm -hmm. is again about prioritization and to say like um you know we've tried some other things and we look at reality and the reality is that these things have become really important but they're like currently managed a certain way and we need to 
ensure mm -hmm. that like has a way that we can prioritize specifically that thing and, and like do it together right so i think that this this is an important aspect of this is the ability for us to pool money both as individuals and companies toward like a cause uh, i guess like uh, this thing we believe should receive priority uh like to this yeah. effect. Um, I agree. And and Brian, that's a very good point because like the kind of commercial or for-profit kind of space has a very clear way of signaling, right? You 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 get you have investors who want to put money in your project. So that it's a way of like saying this is something we want to see in the world and we're you know investing in it and we have equity and ownership. And kind of the if you want the commons or the community space, um, it doesn't have such a mechanism. But it's it's you know how do we how do we pull money from different sources and make ideas happen, right? Make make things come to life that we don't want to be owners of, but we want to see in the world. Um, and so that's kind of um, how I, you know, how I see Open Collective as well, like this place where we can. Kind of signal to the world that this is something that w we want to see and we're willing to put money um, to make that happen and to see that happen and also invite others since it's not a zero sum game right and there is no cup table we can invite as many people as as we want to kind of join this effort right to yeah it is yeah happening in the world yeah and, and i think that's you know one thing that's true about open that's genuinely true about open source that's not necessary people like to say but isn't necessarily true about other spaces which is like the you know the rising tide lifts all boats sort of philosophy that's very obvious when you look at things like better web platform documentation and you know better developer tooling and and we might decide as a community to like compete on more effective or efficient or ergonomic linting tools or something like that but but that's fine that's healthy and and we can kind of evaluate how successful or interesting one is over the other using open collective uh funding and you know other things as as feedback um into into the system what we try to do in Open Collective is to somehow unlock a new economy, right, where the community has economic power. And so if projects that are, are, are willing to say, to say we'll give, you know, someone who's willing to go and knock on all of these companies' doors um, to get these investments, and they say, like, we'll give you a cut from what you can raise or, you know, we'll pay you a salary for doing this, then the tool is there. And, and we would love to see yeah. that happen. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, what's what's really interesting about this to me is that um, like the more we look at it and the more we think about it and the more we experiment with it, it's clear that there's sort of like not a single the problem, but several the problems for mm -hmm. us to, to think about and, and explore how to solve. So, you know, one is something like open web docs where we can say um, what we need is to pull our money toward this specific cause because we have identified this one cause that like we should support. But then there's all of this other stuff underneath, which is sort of buried. It's like the wires and the, you know, uh, all this other stuff that everything depends on that we also would like to support, but we like, it seems like we need, sort of more coarse grained proxies for that somehow where it would be great if we could, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really have an idea, but there are other things that people are trying like coil with web monetization um, or brave also does some things where like you can put $5 a month into some bucket and then we can distribute it somehow. And it's, it's not very much to any one of them, but if everybody puts in five dollars a month, it starts to be a lot, you know, and everybody gets some amount of the support, which is interesting because if you think about the way that literally everything is funded in terms of the web today, it, not the, the larger web, but like in terms of web browsers, ultimately it is advertising in default search that is like the lion's share of where the money comes from. <laughs> 
And if you think about that, like those are, they make pennies for the most part at a time. So it's just that there's really a lot of them. I, I think back your stack, uh, tide lift, and then to a certain degree, what GitHub is doing with GitHub sponsors kind of are in a, like in a similar space, right? Where, where they're tackling the problem of funding these very important tools from the standpoint of, you know, hey, company that is using these tools and maybe consuming them without real insight that you are, that's a total, that's a definitely a thing that happens, right? You People are not necessarily fully aware of all the things that they're relying on. Let's surface this information to you. And then now that you can see your, that your applications, your business relies on these free resources that you didn't pay for, like, you know, why don't you kick some dollars that way so that you can support them um, and hopefully, you know, make sure they stay maintained for you um, for for years and years to come. And that's like, that's solving the the problem for one customer, so to speak, right? The corporate customer who, you know, builds applications or services and, you know, wants to be, you know, a, a mindful consumer of open source and, you know, is going to going to do it that way. But I think for a lot of companies, they look at that and they say, oh, OK, well, you know, sure, um, that seems reasonable. But what do <laughs> what 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 else can I get out of this money that I'm I, I've always gotten something for free here and now you're asking me to pay for it you know is there something you can you know they want they want to buy something with that um, instead of just seeing it as the a donation or a or compensation for services they've been receiving for years you know can I get support for these tools you know can I get you know access to the developer the maintainer you know for some period of time and I that concerns me because although I think like uh, the the way um, Tidelift is working that into their business model is is not too problematic but I think it's concerning in some other places because I don't want to see open source developers get uh, and maintainers get turned into like gig economy workers who we know now are very easily that like that's a system that very easily exploits um, people and I I don't know like I think one one thing that's been interesting as we do these experiments in and and learn more about how to sustainably fund open source is uh, getting more information and saying oh, okay this is beginning to look like a system that we know to be problematic you know how to how do we like avoid that you know as I said I think the that those are solutions that that. Um, address the selling to a specific customer, and then you have, you know, um, more democratic and open ways of sponsoring open source financially through um, Open Collective and Gitcoin, for example. And that can be very meaningful. It depends on like the generosity of like the broader community of of open source. So I don't. And it's very. It's very. It's all very complicated <laughs> yeah totally look um Dwayne O'Brien um um indeed and indeed and formerly you know everywhere um he's um he's been thinking a lot about this um kind of from the from the standpoint of like so what he's thinking about is how can we what are the standards that we're gonna hold um corporate actors to Right? What defines a good corporate citizen of the open source ecosystem? Like I, I honestly refuse to cut all of this slack to companies saying, you know, oh, they just, you know, they have something for free and so they're gonna want more. Which I think that if we believe that, they're gonna believe that, and then if if they're gonna act accordingly. And so I think that a really good step towards um improving right this um relationship between this power relationship because that's what it is right it's a very it can be a very unhealthy power relationship um and so i think as with every power relationship 
that is asymmetric. Um, we need to be able, as a community, to come up with standards um, and a set of expectations for what a company should and shouldn't do and what is okay for a company to do or not do in the open source uh, space. Um, and if you look outside of the open source world, there has been um, examples where this happened. Like we do not tolerate anymore a company that pollutes, you know, or that is not, like we've decided as a, as, as a society that that is not okay. And so for, I think that for the open source space, um, we still need to grow a little bit and mature towards that. And Duane is trying to um, to come up with um, ideas and, 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 and solutions and standards in this particular space. And that I agree, I think it's it can be very problematic. And so um, we just cannot, yeah, we, can, we just cannot accept that companies are gonna behave like that. Um, I think it's a good point if if we sort of expect that they are, then we sort of, you know, I don't know, that's, that's, a, that's a solid point, Pia. All right. So uh, I just wanted to thank both of you for coming on and chatting with me. I actually like wish that we could spend even more time <laughs> chatting about a lot of this stuff. It's so full of like interesting challenges and possibilities. And uh, I really look forward to continuing to work with both of you on these challenges so yeah thanks for coming thank you so much for having um me on brian and and pia as always it's like like what very wonderful to chat with you and um talk to you on the internet <laughs> from the internet on the internet thank you um yeah it's exciting um we have i'm very excited that open collective is collaborating with both of you in these um, exciting experiments. Uh, and I'm very grateful for your trust um, to do this. So yeah, thank you.